Morning Lionhearts, it's your old pal Jordan the Lion. How are you all doing today? Oh, okay. Well, kind of a mixed response today. Well, I'm doing pretty good. I'm feeling good that I moved a couple of months ago because today when I went online, I noticed that my old area of Hollywood, a water pipe broke and spilled out four feet, four to five feet of water flooding Hollywood. And uh, man, I just can't even imagine. They said they couldn't get it to stop. It was going for hours. So I'm really fortunate that, uh, you know, someone was looking out for me that I got out of there. So we're gonna go out and do a vlog today. And, you know, I love the Bee Gees. I, I love not so much the disco stuff, but I really like the early stuff. And uh, I remember when I was growing up watching a VH1 behind the music on their brother, Andy Gibb. Uh, not only in the Bee Gees were there three really talented brothers, Robin Morris and Barry Gibb, but they had a younger brother, Andy Gibb, and he unfortunately had a pretty sad ending and passed away at the age of 30 years old. So we're going to go to his grave today and pay our respects, and I'll tell you a little bit about the life and the career of Andy Gibb and kind of what some people believe was really the downfall of his life or what led to the sad times in his life. So. Days with Jordan the Lion, it begins right now. And that's who you heard tapping around in the background, didn't they? Didn't they? You're such a good boy. So today's memorial vlog takes us to Forest Lawn Hollywood Hills and the Court of Remembrance section. We've been here many times. There we go, Forest Lawn Drive, that's what we want. I just had to stop out here at this fountain. This place is just so beautiful. There's the section we're looking for. So when you enter this statue over here is where Betty Davis is buried. But Andy Gibb is actually over this section. And there is footage of his funeral, and you see his brothers walking past this statue right over here when they were laying him to rest. So he's right around this corner. Even though he was born in Manchester, England, and died in Oxford, his adoptive home was here, Hollywood, Los Angeles, so he's right over here. I believe I did put together a, um, a cemetery video here one time where I showed his grave once before, but I didn't really go into any detail. Okay, so he's pretty easy to find. He's not in this first section right here. He's in this section with the benches because he has one of those benches. And I believe the first bench is his. Yep. Eternally in our hearts and everlasting love. And then he's buried right there. So his story is that he was born in Manchester and then at the age of six months, his family moved to Australia and he grew up outside of Brisbane. His um, brothers came to fame as the Bee Gees while they were living there. And so they ended up coming back when he was about six or seven back to the London area. And that's where his brothers were making records. His brothers were basically managed by the same people that were managing the Beatles. And so they, they took off pretty quickly. So Andy was, he kind of had a, you know, kind of a treasured life. He got to ride around in limos as a kid and they would give him money to go off and hang out with his friends and have a driver take them places. But everyone always said he had a heart of gold. He was, whenever he was around, he was always very cheerful and chipper and always wanted to be liked and showed some interest in music. So his brother Barry gave him a guitar 
and kind of talked him into once he saw that his brother Andy was getting pretty good um, the family the parents of the Gibb brothers moved to Spain Ibiza Spain and Andy went with them and at the age of 12 he made his first performance at a beachside bar <laughs> if you can believe it he said he didn't get paid or anything but that's when he first started performing knew that he loved it and Barry kind of talked him into quitting school and pursuing a career in music so that's pretty much what he ended up doing so the Bee Gees have been successful in Australia and that's kind of what Barry told Andy he should do. He should go live with their sister in Australia and work on his career there putting together a band which is what he did. He would put together a band, they demoed a little bit but then the band broke up and eventually a well-known producer, Cole Joyce, met Andy and started recording some of his stuff and thought that he you know, looked like he had a pretty good future as just a teenager in music. So they released Words and Music and it became a hit in Australia. So as they were working on those recordings, Andy would start showing signs of just disappearing for times, something that he would eventually do quite a bit later on in his life. But he would quit the recording sessions at some point, go join a band called Zenta, and they would end up touring, opening for the Bay City Rollers and Captain Tennille, and then Zenta eventually became Andy's backing band. But then when Andy got signed on with his brother's management, they decided to drop the band. And Andy flew to Miami where his brothers were living and started working on his first recording. Now what's interesting is that Hotel California was being recorded at the same time, the same place. And so Joe Walsh ended up playing guitar on two of the songs on Andy's first record. So when it comes to making your first record, it certainly wouldn't hurt having the Bee Gees as your brother, especially when Barry Gibb writes your first hit song, I Just Want to Be Your Everything. He also sang the backup vocals on that. That came out in 1976, immediately became a hit. So in 1977, Andy released Flowing Rivers, which ended up having a huge success. His brothers also would co-write songs on there and it would quickly sell a million records. And at the height of his brother's career, when they were doing Saturday Night Fever, riding high on the charts with that, Andy's song would come in and top them on the charts for a short time. Now it always seemed like Andy could never really feel like he was living up to his family name or what his brothers had achieved. And so he was always seeking that, never feeling fulfilled. And uh, unfortunately in 1980, he would release his last record, his third record. Um, he would end up going on to start dating Victoria Principal, who was a major star. Uh, you know, she would end up becoming known for Dallas and they had this really tumultuous breakup, a really public thing that really destroyed him. And a lot of it had to do with her not wanting him to do drugs. He had gotten involved in the party scene of cocaine and drinking and she gave him an ultimatum that it was her or the drugs and he just couldn't give up the drugs. So he had said in interviews later that it really hurt him. This breakup really destroyed his insides because he said he felt that um, it was a disease that he was suffering with and that with the breakup he didn't feel that Victoria showed any um, any feeling that she was upset and that he felt like less of a man because he was the upset one after the breakup. And that pretty much plagued him the rest of his life. The failure of his relationship with Victoria, uh, the failure to, in his mind, achieve as much as his brothers, he would quit making music for a time. His lifestyle would become pretty well known and it would be hard for him to get work. Now there were projects that did take chances on him. He did go and perform in Joseph the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat as well as the Pirates of Penzance. And even the director of Joseph the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat on Broadway said out of the seven actors that they had had performing in that role, to that point, Andy was the best they had ever had. The problem was his his addictions. And, and his addictions, like I said, came from psychological. So they said he would just not show up for performances. When he was there, he was amazing. But when he wasn't, a lot of times he just couldn't bring himself to leave his hotel or his apartment. He would sit there watching TV, doing drugs, and then he would disappear for the weekend. And when he would show back up on Tuesday, they said he looked like a beat wreck and would be very 
ashamed, almost like a puppy dog, like very uh, ashamed of not showing up and apologetic and everything, but they ended up having to fire him from all those jobs. He ended up getting a job on the TV show Solid Gold as a host, would end up getting fired from that as well for absenteeism. I mean, that basically became the downfall of his life. His record label dropped him, the Broadway shows had dropped him, the TV show had dropped him, and it was all because of him not showing up for work. So him having the close family that he did, they did know there was a problem, they could see it, and they stepped in. His brothers told him that he needed to seek help, and so Andy would go out to Palm Springs, go to Betty Ford, stay there as long as they would allow you to, and he would seemingly clean up his life. He would attempt at making a comeback record, and even his brothers would announce that he was joining the group, that there was gonna now be, the Bee Gees were gonna be a four. But when Andy went back to Oxford, working on that comeback record, he just fell into the depths of depression once again. You see, by this point, he was almost 30 years old, and he had been through multiple rehabilitations. He had had stints performing in Vegas and Tahoe. He had really tried to do everything he could to resurrect his career, and now he felt that he was letting people down with this recording that he was working on now to be his comeback, even though he would say, my brother Barry says, well, you never really went away. But to him, it was a big deal, and it was a comeback, and all he really wanted was people to love him. And to let you know how serious this was, Barry Gibbett arranged a deal already with Island Records, so Andy pretty much had a deal set in place. Every time they made a, an agreement for a meeting to sign the papers, Andy would disappear and never show up, so he never ended up signing the papers for that deal. Now, right before his 30th birthday, he had seemingly cleaned up. He wasn't doing cocaine, he wasn't drinking or anything, he was just battling a major depression. And like I said, most of it came from missing Victoria as well as feeling that he had failed in life. So he called his mother. His mother spent the 30th birthday with him. She was the only one that was there. And Andy, a few days later, went to the hospital suffering from chest pains. Now, unfortunately, the hospital didn't contact his Los Angeles physicians to get the records or they would have seen that he had internal problems. This was all from a series of drug abuse and alcohol abuse over the years. Um, them not doing that, they didn't know what to check for, what to test for. Andy was released and then within another day he was back in there. His mother said that they gave him something to put him to sleep and told her that she couldn't stay the night and that it wouldn't matter anyway that that Andy would just be sleeping all night. So she said she left and the next morning he woke up. The doctor said, do you mind if we take some blood, Andy? He said, sure. And the doctor turned around to grab something and heard Andy exhale and he was gone. He was gone. Sad part is that now Barry Gibb is the only brother still alive. And I've seen him say in interviews that every one of his brothers when they passed he had had a falling out with them he had tried to do tough love with andy he said and shortly before andy died he called him saying you need to get your act together you need to clean up you need to take this seriously instead of giving him compassion and love he said i gave him tough love thinking that was the way to do it that's the way i always been taught to do it and andy passed away and then the same things would happen with his brothers Morris and Robin, so Barry's the last remaining Gibb and he lives with that guilt. If you'd like to check out some of Andy Gibb's greatest works, it's Everlasting Love, Shadow Dancing, I Just Want to Be Your Everything, Love is Thicker Than Water, they're all pretty great. Now reading up on Andy, I found out something really interesting that apparently Freddie Mercury liked Andy's voice enough to where he invited him to sing the first verse on the Play the Game record and they ended up not using it, but apparently there is a version out there of Andy singing on that recording in the first verse. So of course there's a bench here in Andy's honor for fans and loved ones. And then his grave is right here. 
And I am surprised he's here. Even though, I mean, his days here in Hollywood, those were, that was where he chose to live, but he didn't have necessarily the greatest life here. And I believe that the rest of his family is buried in Thames. Incidentally, there is a cenotaph for Andy Gibb there in that cemetery as well. The press originally reported that Andy Gibb died of cocaine overdose, but that was not true. He actually had nothing in his system at the time of his death, but his brothers and his mother all said, really, that, that is what killed him. It was his abuse of those throughout his life that did destroy him, and that that really was what the cause of death was, sadly. Victoria Principal said she always knew it wasn't if, but when that lifestyle would take Andy's life and just five days after he turned 30 years old, he passed away. And you can see March 5th, 1958 to March 10th, 1988. An everlasting love. I do think it's kind of cool that his most popular songs were written by his brothers and him. Shadow Dancing was written by he and all three of his brothers, and then Barry helped him with quite a bit of his other songs. Rest in peace, Andy Gibb. I stopped at home and picked up this guy. He wants to go out and play, so we'll go do that too. Oh yeah, there's a lot of dogs out here today. You should be able to find someone to play with. Or pee with. Awesome. He always needs a little interaction. Always my dog peeing. Always. Hey, Ja, have you been chasing the dogs? Yeah, you have. You're having fun, aren't you? All right, Lion Hearts, we're going to call it a day. I hope you enjoyed this vlog today on Andy Gibb. Thank you, Ready Hip. Jeff Qualio and Lacey Mitchell for becoming my newest Patreons. We'll see you all next time. Have a great night and goodbye.